All right, problem number one. This one is about using R to run a simulation to verify some things that were briefly mentioned in the textbook. Like if you run an experiment 20 times and it doesn't work, you're likely to find a significant result, what was it, 0.64 of the time. If you did it 50 times, you'd find that result 0.92 of the time, which is a lot. So we're gonna see if you can reproduce those numbers using the R binome function. Okay, the next two problems have to do with something called p-curve analysis, and we'll talk more about that in class. To prepare you for those ideas, I've got these two problems for you to try out. The first one is about what kind of p-values you would expect to find if, let's say, 100 people replicated an experiment that was designed to fail. So if there was some experiment that we know doesn't do anything, the manipulation isn't causally effective, if 100 people went out and redid that experiment, what would they find? What would that collection of p-values look like? So I want you to simulate the null, collect all those p-values, and plot them in a distribution, and tell me what the distribution looks like. The third problem is the same thing, except Let's imagine the experiment actually does work and it produces a true effect. Let's make that true of 0.5 of a standard deviation. But I want you to run a simulation in R pretending that that experiment had been replicated a whole bunch of times. I want you to save all the p-values, put them in a distribution, and plot it. And then tell me what that distribution looks like. And I've got some bonus questions. Feel free to check those out. All right, so right now I'm going to check out this garden and see if there's anything growing. Yeah. Oh, there's some buds coming in here. That's really exciting. All right, good luck. All right, let's do this. I've got my Lab 6 R Markdown ready to go. I copied in all the questions. Let's move on to question number one. So we are trying to reproduce some of these values from the textbook. One example here is if you repeat an experiment that doesn't work 20 times, Remember the problem of the replications of a meaningless experiment, the alpha and the captain's age issue. So if you repeat a, a null experiment 20 times, the textbook mentions you're guaranteed to find a significant result with alpha 0.05 at 0.64. So we're asked to make use of the R binome function and reproduce these values. Let's go ahead and do that. So here's the R binome function. We've used this in previous uh, lectures. And just to remind, N is the number of observations, size, that's the number of trials, and prob is the probability of success on each trial. So for example, if we are gonna do something 20 times, sorry, 20 times, we're gonna run an experiment 20 times, Every time we run the experiment, we do it once. And there's a probability that we'll get a result less than 0.05. Uh, what's the probability of that? 0.05. Well, that, getting that result happens 5% of the time. So we're going to basically see here a bunch of zeros. Okay, that's what we saw this time. We ran this experiment 20 times. And this time, out of 20, nothing happened. If we do this again, oh, we got three ones. That means in that go, we got three successes. So we would have made three type one errors there. Okay, so we know about the replicate function. We've used this before too. Let's just do a quick Monte Carlo simulation. So we're gonna simulate the process of repeating the experiment 20 times and Basically, what we want to do is add up, oh, oops, put the sum in the wrong place. I'd like to add up these things, and I'm going to put them into a variable called A. So let's take a look at A. We could do a histogram of A. Okay, so we're seeing the kinds of things that would generally happen here. And we can see that it looks like there's there's definitely a bunch of zeros, so that means that if you run the experiment 20 times, it's definitely possible that you will never make a type 1 error. But look at all these other counts here are times when you did make a, count, a type 1 error. So I'd like to go into the variable A, and I'd like to see how many A's, how many of the numbers inside of this, um, this is 10,000 sums, 
So how many of them are greater than zero? Oh, that's all of the ones that are greater than zero. I want to know how many of them there are. So there's 6,358. If we divide by the 10,000, we're approximating that 0.64 probability, right? So you're on average, I should have, uh, well, you're guaranteed to find a significant result with 0.64 probability. So we simulated that here. Great, we got that first one done. Let's move on to the second one. I'm going to call this one B. And here, uh, what happens if you repeat the experiment 50 times? Well, let's just do that. Put a 50 there and see what happens. Uh, you can see there's um, way more times when out of the 50, you'd get a significant result. You'd make a type 1 error. And if we just run this, we get 92%. So we're able to use the R binome function here to re uh, reproduce these probabilities from the textbook. Okay, what about the second part of question number one? So we're asking about an ineffectual experiment that was conducted 20 times, just like above here. However, let's imagine there was four groups and the experimenter would accept a significant result from any of the orthogonal linear contrasts. What would the probability be here of finding a significant result? I hope that was clear. This is what I was thinking we would do with this question because we've just been through a lab on orthogonal contrasts. We know there's four groups. We know there are four minus one possible orthogonal contrasts. That means there's three independent uh, F tests you could run every time you run this experiment. So if we're thinking about an experiment that gets run 20 times, there's three opportunities here to get a significant result at the 0.05 level. So this is more appropriate for this situation, changing that one to a three here. This would effectively produce the probabilities we're looking for. We need to do this whole replicate thing. So let's, I'm just gonna pop this in here. This is the R binome function I want. I'm gonna slide that in. And let's just call this D. Put these values in here and change these to Ds. And we get, ooh, 95% probability. All right, so that's that whole family-wise error rate thing we were talking about in lab in action. Let's move on to question number two. All right, question number two. Basically what we're asking here is what would happen if a bunch of researchers tried to replicate a study that wasn't working, that was ineffectual, where the manipulation doesn't do anything? Effectively, this is like saying, what happens if a bunch of people tried to measure the null hypothesis a whole bunch of times? So if a bunch of researchers replicated a study that was actually a type one error in the first place, what kind of p-values would they find? So let's say we had 100 researchers, everyone re reproduces the study, they all run their significance test and they get a p-value. If we looked at all of those p-values, what would they look like? What would the sampling distribution of p-values look like? And what shape does this distribution have? Well. That's the point of this question. Let's see if we could figure it out. We could approach this in a number of different ways. Here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to go back to our t-test example. I'm going to simulate uh, a null hypothesis, and then I'm going to get my p-values from that simulation. I'm going to do that simulation a whole bunch of times and save all the p-values and see what I get. So let me try to talk this one out loud. I'm going to make a normal distribution and I don't know, I'm going to sample 10, let's say 20 numbers. I don't think it really matters here. 20 numbers from a normal distribution. Okay, now I'm thinking I'm going to have two groups. So I'm going to sample another 20 numbers. Let's put this in a vector. Does this make sense? Let's see. Uh, we could work with this. 
Okay, I'm going to put these into a dependent variable. I need an independent variable, and I, I want there to be two groups. So I want each group to have 20 values. And we could put all of this into a tibble, I guess. All right, let's see if that works. Look at my simulated data. Yeah, that'll do. And what I want to do now is run a little t-test on this data. Uh, data equal, I'm going to use the formula dv by iv. We'll assume this is a between subjects design and we will make the equal variance assumption. So there we did a t-test. Oh, I got a 0.06 on this t-test. I mean, so every, every time we do this, we're simulating the null hypothesis here, aren't we? We're imagining that the data in both groups comes from the exact same normal distribution, and we're calculating a t-test and getting a p-value. I got a different one this time. I got a point, and here's another p-value. So what I want to do is a, a, this whole process a whole bunch of times, save all the p-values, and then look at what they look like. If you can already anticipate what this should look like, I'm proud of you. All right, we'll put this in a loop. But before we do that, I think this is how you get the p-value out. Right, so that's my p-value. You know, I'm realizing as I'm doing this, I could probably rewrite this in one line. Maybe we'll do that in a moment. Uh, well, let's just do it in a loop for now. We decided to or I decided to persist in this method. I want to create a variable called my p-values. And I'm going to say, uh, let's get, let's get 10,000 values here. Well, whatever, we don't need to do that. We can, we can just make an empty vector. And for each one of these runs of the loop, we want to put in the p-value that we save. So let's just quickly do this. How long does that take? Mm. This is taking a while. I think I might want to rewrite this code. Oh, it's done. And okay, let's just look at the histogram. We, we did it. Oh, it's called my p-values. Okay, there's the histogram of p-values. And the answer to the question is effectively you should find a flat distribution here. Every p-value that you could find between zero and one is equally, has an equal chance of occurring. That's the, that's the kind of insight here when you're talking about p-values uh, and you're talking about the question, what is the likelihood of finding particular p-values under the null? You are likely to find any of the values between zero and one equally frequently. So if we had this question, if a bunch of researchers set out to replicate a study that originally was a type 1 error, and if there was 100 researchers, in our expectation is that the researchers would get any possible p-value equally frequently. Probably five of the researchers would get a p-value less than 0.05, because that's 5% of 100. But, you know, 10 of the researchers would probably get a p-value between 0.5 and 0.6, or between 0.9 and 1, you know, because that, those are 10% of the p-values, too. All right, I just commented this whole thing out. I'm going to try it one more way that's much should be much faster. I've copied my t-test, and instead of using this approach where I have a formula and I've got some data like this, uh, if I remember my t-test function, I can just supply two vectors. So I could take the values here and the values here, and these would be treated as two different vectors, a group A, a group B. If we did this, um, we would basically be randomly sampling numbers from a normal distribution representing the null, 
running the t-test and extracting the t-value. So this whole thing is like doing that pro replicating the experiment one time. We could pop this into the replicate function and do it 10,000 times. And then we could save the results in a variable, just like this. So let's see how long this takes. One, two, that was much faster. And if we do the histogram of this, we should see another flat distribution. All right, moving on to question number three. It's much like the first one, but we're going to assume now that group A has a larger mean than group B by 0.5 standard deviations. So here's a situation where the first effect is true. The effect reported by some researcher is true. If we had a whole bunch of people in the, in the world try to replicate this effect, um, what would happen? And what we want to know is if uh, all of those researchers saved their p-value and looked at it, and we looked across all of the p-values, this would be like a, a sampling just another sampling distribution of p-values. What would we expect to find in this situation? What would that? So this is what the distribution of p-values looks like when there is no true effect. What will it look like when there is a true effect? Let's grab our code from before. We can reuse this down here make an R code chunk, pop in our uh, simulation code, and all we need to do is think, okay, here's group A, and uh, it has a larger mean than group B. We've got our 20 subjects already. We're gonna make that mean larger by 0.5. All right, let's run this and check out the histogram. Very different looking histogram. This is got a curve to it and is one of the reasons why there is such a thing called p-curve analysis, which we will discuss in the lecture. But for now, it's just to point out that when there really is a true effect, we expect that the kinds of p-values you will get will not be equally distributed between zero and one. In the context of null hypothesis testing, you'd expect to find smaller p-values more often than not. And like I said, we'll talk more about this in class. This was just a, an assignment to get you to start to think about these issues. Okay, let's take a look at the bonus questions. Question number four is the same as the one we just did. We're gonna make another a sampling distribution of p-values, only this time we're going to assume the experiment had four groups instead of two. So group A will have a mean that is 0.5 standard deviations larger than groups B, C, and D. Let's see if we can make a sampling distribution of p-values that would be expected for the linear contrast evaluating the research hypothesis that A is greater than B, which is equal to C and D. Now to do this, I'm gonna go back up to the top or near or close to the top and copy this code that I commented out. I'm gonna modify this one for this problem. Oh. Let's see. Now if I highlight all of this, go up to code and say uncomment, we get that just like that. I'm going to set this to 10 because I want to do a little test to make sure I'm doing it right. We want to have four groups. We want to treat this as a factor. And if we're gonna have four groups, we're gonna need some more data in here. We're gonna make group one have a standard deviation different mean from the others. So there's our simulation data, and we should see something that looks like this. We should see that there's uh, a factor for the IV. Great. I'm going to page down a bit here. I'm going to start building my ANOVA because I know I need to go and I think just like this. I'm going to call this AOV.out. And I know I could go like this. 
to look at the ANOVA. I'm just building some things just as sanity checks while I do this. All right, so really quickly here, I made some simulated data for the situation and I ran an ANOVA. Now I wanna build in some of the linear contrast stuff. And for that, I let me see if I can do this by memory. Oh, otherwise I'll probably just go back to the lab and borrow some of the code. I remember that I wanna have a linear contrast and that contrast needs to define this research hypothesis. So let's see. We're basically saying that the first group is bigger than the other three groups, which are equal. So that balances it out. A is bigger than the other three groups. And if you add this up, you get a zero. So this could be our contrast. If we go in and find the independent variable and we look at its contrasts, we can see that default contrast table there. Now I want to assign this one contrast to it. It's not found. Okay, I need to do that, do this. Now when I run this ANOVA, I know that I'm going to be able to find, I'm going to be able to output that contrast, but I have to use the summary.aov function. I'm surprised I'm doing this by memory. I, now this is the part where I'm probably going to forget. Let's see if I can do it. I remember there's a split function and oof, a list, the name of the independent variable, which is IV. And then this is another list. Is this right? Oh my God. Something like this. Did I get it? Okay. Whew. Wow. All right. So there's our syntax we need to get that linear contrast in there and get it to print out. Now, what we're interested in is this p value here. Okay. So if we put all of this into save results and then we interrogated save results just like this. We can find that p-value and just so you can see what this would look like, there's three numbers here that we're interested in the second number. So I think what we've done in this example is we've got our uh, p-value extracted for that linear contrast. Okay, so if I, if I ran this whole thing right now, we would be simulating this alternative hypothesis and doing it 10 times and we could look at our histogram of p-values. I'm just gonna do this a thousand times. We could do it 10,000, but that would take a little bit longer. Okay, that didn't take too long. Let's see. Okay, so there's our p-curve for this particular linear contrast. Now you might start wondering, like, how was this different than what we did up here? Well, this had two groups. This one had four. Uh, in some sense, it was very similar in that uh, this one group was different from the second group and the third group and the fourth group in the same way. But in order to simulate this specific p-curve for this specific linear contrast, uh, this would be a more uh, particular way to do it that would be more appropriate to these to this design okay question number five we've got a one factor ANOVA with four groups same as above we're going to run two simulations of the null hypothesis one for the omnibus test and one for the specific linear contrast mentioned above the question is is the probability of making a type one error, that is the probability for rejecting the null with alpha 0.05, the same for the omnibus test versus a specific contrast. And we'll just use this specific contrast as an example. So let's check it out. I'm gonna go 
and borrow the code from up here, pop it in. We could work with this, I think. We want to simulate the null hypothesis so we can set group A back to zero. So now the data for all four of these groups is coming from the same distribution. We have set up our contrast already and I'm going to save two sets of p-values. The omnibus p-values and the contrast p-values. This one is saving the, uh, th this one is saving the contrast p-values. And the first p-value that's reported, and let me just show you here, so if I run this, 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 and that, <laughs> we can look at the save results variable. So the p-value here is for the overall f-test, and this p-value is for this one contrast. All right, so we should change this to omnibus p-values, which is what we set up here. Okay, let's run this a thousand times. So we've simulated the null a thousand times, and I wanna go into my omnibus p-values, and I want to see how many of them are less than 0.05. And, uh, you know, this should be 5% of them, right? So there's 50 of them, or 48. Now we did 1,000 simulations, so that's pretty close to 0.05 of them were exactly close based on that simulation. Well, how about the contrast p-values? Also 0.5. Cool. I mean... Uh, if you were wondering if there'd be a difference here, these are both independent, they're considered independent uh, tests. And so the probabilities associated with them should be independent. Um, and it looks like they are. Whoops, I messed up. Wait a minute, I was... That needed to be the contrast p-values. All right, so we've solved the problem. We've shown that the probability uh, making a type 1 error under the null for the omnibus test is, oops, I have to redo this, is the same as the probability of making a type 1 error for a specific contrast. And I'm sorry that this was a little choppy here in terms of the my speaking. <laughs> it's uh, still er it's a little early in the morning. Uh, anyways, you got the solutions there, and we'll see you next class.